to-do list. I will sometimes do something that isn't on my to-do list, put it onto my to-do list just so I can feel the joy of checking it off. It frustrates me when I feel like my completed to-do list is done, but then I find something wasn't done, and now i got to go and do it. That is a source of frustration for me. When I find said golf ball, it frustrates me when it's out of bounds. <laughs> that, can be, that can be a frustrating find. And I'm a good golfer, so I just kick it back into place when no one's looking, but, but that's neither here or there. What we find frustrating or worth celebrating communicates a lot about what we value. If it was truthful, if I really was frustrated when I found my kids, so that's a joke. <laughs> but if that was true, what would that communicate about my relationship with my kids or what I value and what, I, and, and, and what is meaningful to me? If I wasn't kidding, if, if, I, if I was like, hey, you know what, finding things on my to-do list, I'm not going to do them. Does it show that I value the to-do list? Does it show that, I, that this really has meaning in, in, my, in my life? What about what God celebrates? What about what frustrates God in what he finds or, or, or doesn't find? Or do we value the same things? We're going to look at today and we're going we're to see what, what God values finding, what he celebrates when he finds. And if we want, if we are clinging after, if we are seeking the heart of God, what he finds and celebrates over, shouldn't that be true of his people? And so we start a series called Pray for One. We're going to be in Luke chapter uh, 15 for this week and next week. Uh, you can turn there now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. Fast through the Old Testament, get to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It will also be on the screens. Here's how it goes. He says this, now, now the tax collectors and the sinners were drawing near to him, him being Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes. Right there, right in the first verse, we have two different groups of people. We have groups, of, one group of people, here are the sinners, and then we're going to say the tax collectors. They, in a society sense, are the worst of the worst. And so here, society would name the worst human beings on the planet are coming to Jesus. And before Jesus is also what society would say are the religious, are the holy, the ones that have it all together. <laughs> They're all there before Jesus. He has two distinct crowds before him. And what are the religious people doing? They grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Sinners, no, there has never been somebody as holy as Jesus to walk this planet. He was perfectly holy, walking this planet. And guess what? The most unholy of people actually wanted to be around him. Why? Because every other message that they hear is, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. And they come to Jesus and they find hope. Yes, you are a dirty, rotten sinner, and that's why I'm here. I value you in your dirty, rotten sin to come to you. And so they hear this message of hope, and they're coming to Jesus. And the religious would look at this and say, grumble, complain, would say, this isn't a good thing. This is a bad thing. Why on earth would they say this is a bad thing? Because they're looking at what, what their rules and regulations, how they would apply certain rules and regulations and say, well, this makes the sinners and, and, and the Pharisees or the tax collectors, they're unclean. And if you hang out with the unclean, guess what? You become unclean. So Jesus, you're religious and you're hanging out with them. That makes you unclean. Praise God. Jesus doesn't ascribe to their definition of cleanliness, but he reaches in to us. I, uh, we are attacking this Love One, Love All campaign to give out 100,000 of these this year with an act of kindness in our community. And I was convicted a, a few months ago when I was reading God's Word, and, and, and I was like, okay, my habit that I've, I've adopted is that on, on Mondays and or, or Wednesday, I'll go to 7-Eleven, I'll buy some packs of gum, I'll get a God Loves You card, and I'll walk around downtown handing out God Loves You card. And I, and I was reading this, and I was like, well, well Jason, what if, are you willing to let it cost you a little bit? And, I, and, and, and so I, I'm convicted by that, and it just so happens that I'm walking down to 7-Eleven, and I see a homeless man on a bench. And I was like, 
oh, God, your word. Oh, it's going to cost me. Okay. And so I go to 7-Eleven, and I get a $20 gift card. And I walk back up to this homeless man, and I give him the $20 gift card with this message that says, God loves you, and so do we. You have value. You have worth. The, 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 the revival did not sweep across downtown. He didn't even want to talk to me. So I gave it to him, and I went all my merry way. Then the next week, I go back to the 7-Eleven, and the, and the cashier who, who, I've been, who I got, have gotten to know over the last month says to me, would you know? That man came in here and bought cigarettes. <laughs> Would you know he wasted that? I just wanted to let you know so you don't have to help him in the future. I just wanted to let you know so, so that you would know that he wasted this. And I, I tried telling him, this man showed you kindness. You should be doing this, this, and this, and this. And in my head, I was thinking, we define love differently. We define kindness differently. True, genuine love, doesn't it leave us open to misuse? Doesn't true, genuine love leave, leave us with the option of being hurt? Because if we love only the people that we know will do something good with it, or if we, love, if, we, if we show kindness to only the people that will show us kindness back, is that truly genuine love? And so I didn't change. I didn't blink an eye out. Love this man again. Let him do whatever he wants to do. It. That's on him. But you know what it does when a community of people are willing to love, a whole group of people are willing to love the community? Then you fast forward a week or two, I'm upstairs, there's a the thing called the bid where you, a bunch of businesses get together and they talk about uh, business downtown and how to improve it and whatnot and, and strategies and things of the nature. I got invited there and they said, hey, hey preacher, you're going to have 45 seconds. Don't you dare go over. You're going to have 45 seconds to tell people about your church. And so I, I was like, fine, great. I'm in front of a whole bunch of like up and ups from downtown Tom's River, and I just walked up and I was like, hey, you guys may have heard of us. Uh, we give out these God loves you cards with an act of kindness. We just believe that Jesus Christ died for us, showed us the ultimate act of kindness, and it's our joy to show kindness to other people. They didn't pull the mic from me. <laughs> they didn't say, hey, Jason, afterwards, like the Jesus thing, like never do that again. I didn't see a single one of them roll their eyes. Why? Because as a church, we're living out the message of Jesus Christ. And I got to share with, with a whole bunch of people. Some of them might misuse it. But that is our platform. To say, say to the world that God loves you and so do we. And you know where, what pharisaical approach do we want to take? Do we want to take the pharisaical approach that, hey, we'll welcome in the homeless. We'll celebrate. Hey, the homeless man might come in here. And hey, you know what? Yeah, charge your cell phone. That is a good thing. But then we'll be a Pharisee when we look upon that man with judgment saying, oh, my tax money bought us an iPhone? Oh. Or we'll look at this and say, man, God's forgiveness for me is so good. I love it. But Uncle Timmy, he's a dirtbag. <laughs> Not for him. We'll mumble. We'll complain about people coming and experiencing Jesus. I'm all about a captivating environment. I want captivating environments. I want, I serve an excellent God. I want everything we do to point to an excellent God and an excellent message. I want this to be a prestigious environment. I want to celebrate a prestigious environment. But here is what isn't a captivating environment. We have to understand as we create environments like this, guess what's going to happen as we love the community? Non-prestigious people are going to walk through our doors to experience a prestigious God. And we celebrate that. Dare we never produce an environment like this and say only the prestigious can come. Because that is not at the heart of my Jesus and so he has to tell a bunch of people thinking along those lines, this parable, this story, to make a point. And so he continues and he says, so he told them this parable, specific now to the religious elite. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? He's talking to people that culturally would know what shepherds do. They have sheep. And they, he says this question as a matter of fact. You know that if a herdsman has as a herd and one of them gets lost that they're going to go and find it this is matter of fact but now you're not applying this well and he says and, and, and he would find them uh, when he find found it he lays it on his shoulders that sheep is probably a little dirty isn't it it's had a, quite a journey out in the wilderness and so we're going to find this one sheep that is lost put work and effort in get it on our shoulders get the dirt on us associate with the dirt of the sheep while it's on our, our shoulders. 
And we're going to what? Rejoicing. And when he comes home, why? Because Jesus doesn't leave us in the wilderness. Jesus doesn't leave us where he found us. He brings us home to him. Home is with Jesus. And he calls us together, his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So church, what are we motivated by? Are we motivated, hey, we've had 300 people on a Sunday morning. We good. Are we motivated by all that haven't heard the message of Jesus Christ? Does that motivate us? I have three kids. If I lose one, I still have 66% of my kids. I'm good. No. As a good parent, when I lose Reagan, because she's going to be the one to get lost now, when I lose Reagan, what do I say to the boys? I say, you sit here. Go nowhere. I've lost Reagan. We've lost Reagan. You sit here. You stay here. Go nowhere. I'm going to go find your daughter, your sister. We, the Father, has lost, has, there's lost people out in the community. Some of them don't even know that they are lost. A good Father goes and finds. Doesn't say, I've got enough. I find that one that is lost. Now here's where this rocks our world. Because we understand that people might turn to Jesus. We understand that, hey, I've hit rock bottom. Now I turn. I walk towards Jesus and he embraces me. Yes, he does. But then what about the fact that God would send his one and only son in pursuit of people that while they were still sinners, Christ died for them. While they are lost, while they don't understand they need forgiveness, while they're looking at their lives and saying, I don't need God, that God is in relentless pursuit of those that want nothing to do with him. Will we continue searching? Do we fall prey to comparison and say it's not even worth trying? Because we're comparing their ungodly life to, to our very godly life. We're saying, I don't, uh, you know what, like, I, I'm mad at them for not, for not saying yes to Jesus, for not living like Jesus well, sitting on our high horse saying, I don't want to tell them about Jesus. What? I, I started working, working out with, um, with um, some weights and stuff because I'm doing a triathlon in, in, a, in a less than a month. And I was like, hey, I have to swim a mile. I'm going to die. I don't want to die. And so I was like, but I don't want a pool. I don't have a pool. I don't, I'm not going to go swim in open water because I'll die with a shark attack. I'm not doing, like, I'm going to die. And so I was like, I Googled, I YouTubed, I did all the things that any, any person should do. And, and I was like, okay, well, I need to start lifting a little bit to build my upper body strength so that I can just muscle through the mile swim so I don't die. And so I get to the gym, and I'm, and I'm there on, on the flat bench, and, and I, go to, I go to lay back and start, and start pumping these things. I haven't done this since I was in college. That was many, many moons ago. And so I was like, oh, okay. And so I grabbed two 35s, and I'm, I'm pumping them, right? And I'm like, okay. And I, and I do 12. I do 12 of these bad boys, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I got this. I'm, I'm good. I just, did, I just did some 35s. And then the 24-year-old jerk that's next to me, I look over to him, and he, he was doing 80-pound weights benching these things. And I was like, well, this sucks. I don't want, like, everybody behind me is judging me. He's, ju no one had a conversation with me, but everybody was judging me. <laughs> Here's where comparison happens. When I was on the bench, when I noticed the person next to me pumping out the weight, I could have done two things with comparison. I could have looked at him and I could have said, why? Well, I, I can't do 80 pounds. He must have come out of the womb with an 80-pound dumbbell. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. <laughs> I can't do this no more. I'm out. <laughs> or I could have looked at his journey and said, just that. That's a journey. I could have looked at his 80 pounds and be like, I can get there. I, 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 I like, look at that. That's good. Like, I want that. So I'm going to keep pumping. I'm going to keep going until I can get to that point and then go beyond it. But here's, here's comparison for, for this individual. He could look at me, and I don't know what he was thinking, or even if he even noticed me, but he could have looked at me, and he could have said, Hey, ladies, 35s, I got 80s. Ha ha, look at me, that dirt bag, I'm so much stronger. He could have brought all the attention to himself. Look at all that is good with me. Or if he was a mature lifter, 
he could have looked at me, saw the same exact thing, and said, I was once there. <laughs> Here's some tips on a diet. <laughs> Here's some tips on a technique. Here's how you can get to where I am quickly. What are we doing? Does, com does comparison keep us from even starting the journey? Does comparison say this isn't worth it? Or does comparison drive us to the place of doing something for people that aren't where we are because we want them to come where we are at? You, you'll have people that come to know Jesus. They are, they, are, they are sinners. They are tax collectors. They are dirty, rotten. Okay, both the person that's going to be all sorts of judgy and the person that's not going to be all sorts of judgy, they see the person the exact same way. Jesus says, you're far from God. Okay, we both see people far from God. But what do our values, what do our priorities communicate about the next step? The judgy person will see the exact same place and go to a judgy place. But the person of God that sees the exact same person, his, ne his or her next step will be altogether different based on priorities, based on values. We're going to what we're talking about today, a place of praying for one, praying for that person. Don't stay in your sin. Don't stay far from God. Come to know Jesus. Jesus is good. Jesus is the, is the different maker, difference maker. And so we pray for one. We wake up every single day saying, God, here's somebody that I know by name. They need you. And so I'm going to pray for them every single day. God, use me, use me, use me. I'm going to wake up every single day saying, God, uh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to give uh, a handful of these out. And God, may it open up a conversation. God, may it, may it practically show somebody the love of Jesus Christ so that they will internalize the actual love of Jesus Christ and say yes to you. God, give me an opportunity. This is at the heart of God to pray for those who are lost. We're trying to pray the heart of God, and we're going to name people, and then we're going to take responsibility for them by trying to go after them. Yes, it might be risky. Yes, you might go through open country, but is it not worth it? Because Christ looked at each one of us and said, we are worth it. We take the focus off of ourselves, and we put it on other people. We try reaching people that no one else is reaching. There's a world out there that is lost. There are other churches trying to reach him. Good, we are all in this together. And we're going to try to identify people that no one else is reaching. Why? Because by definition, they're unreached. And we're going to try to give them the love of Jesus Christ in our words and in our actions. And so Jesus then continues with another parable by saying, And what woman, having ten silver coins, roughly a day's wages, something that we would go looking for if we lost a day's wages in our pocket, he, she, if, he, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep, it, sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, uh, saying, rejoice, she has a party. Why? She just found some money, so now she can afford a party. She has a party, she invites everybody back in, and she says, I found this coin, that was lost. She has a reverent party. Come and celebrate. Just so I tell you, there is, more, there, is what? there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Heaven is happy when people turn to Jesus. Heaven is happy to welcome in the tax collector and the sinner. Heaven rejoices, have a, has a party. If you and I say yes to a relationship with Jesus Christ, aren't we going to be with him for eternity having that party? And don't we join the angels now having that party? Angels reflect the heart of God. If we want to reflect the heart of God, we value people that other people may not value. Why? Because God values them. We seek after them. People every day walk in here, walk in churches, walk in wherever environment, and they feel nothing but God forsaken. We, through our actions and our words, get to communicate. They are not God forsaken, but God loved. Why? Because the true goat, the true greatest of all time, looks at all of us and says, you have value enough for my son to die in your place. People lost, people far from God. They don't need a reminder of their sin. They know it. They know they're trying to find hope at the bottom of a cocktail glass. They know that they're trying to find hope in another one-night stand. We get to communicate to them all desires, the truth, the greatest desire flows from Jesus Christ. We get to communicate hope while they feel hopeless, while they're searching for God, or maybe they're not. And when they come back to the Father, we rejoice that the Father has a growing family. Now, I grew up in New England, as you know, and you know where this is going. I love, I love the Red Sox. I went there on my birthday. My wife is a great wife and bought me Red Sox Yankee tickets. 
they lost. And uh, also, on, <laughs> okay. also on my life goals list is, uh, was, because it's now been checked off, that when the Red Sox are in the World Series, I want to bring my boys to a Red Sox World, Ga World Series game so they could have some father and son time bonding over the greatness of the Red Sox. And uh, that happened last, uh, this past October. I don't know if you guys remember that, the Red Sox won the World Series. And, uh, and I, had, I was able to go with my boys because a group of friends that value, value me, value my life goals list, value, value uh, communicated to me, hey, here is some money, and I want you to go take your boys to, to the World Series. And I was like, oh, this is great. And one of those friends was Jay Curcio. Now, here's where Here's the text I got from Jay on my birthday when the Red Sox got destroyed by the Yankees, and I happened to be present for that. Jay was traveling. He said, hey, I hope you're having the happiest of birthdays, like a jerk. And, and we are driving in South Carolina on our way home. He had just finished listening to the game. Uh, do you happen to have the Yankees-Red Sox score? He was throwing me a little bit of shade to say, okay, okay, fine, okay. That was, that was a very offensive text. And so I, I sat on a little bit and then, and then responded. And, and so he, but my point is, is Jay, helped me get to the Red Sox game. Jay was one of the people that gave me some money to go to the Red Sox game. And he very clearly hates the Red Sox. And he gave me money for that. And he communicated as such, Jason, I hope they win game one. <laughs> but then I hope they lose the next four. And I hope they lose the series four to one. I, ain't pray, like, I, I pray you experience a win with your kids, but then nothing else. <laughs> May they lose. <laughs> Jay was able to put some differences aside and say, I value your father-son time with your kids. I will celebrate that with you. Do we do the same when we are chasing after people, saying, you know what, we may have all the differences in the world, but here's the one thing that we should and we want to value together. Eternal time with the Father. We don't have to agree on X, Y, Z, but may this be what motivates us. My friends out there that are lost, that don't have that time with the Father, are we going to do whatever we can, and when they find their Father, our Father, may we celebrate it. The big thought for us this morning is celebration, not frustration, is the attitude of those who pray for one, that when people come to know Jesus, we're not going to be like, oh, bummer, that that dirtbag came to know Jesus. Like, we're going to be like, no, this is great because Jesus changes everything. We're going to have the attitude, you know what? Jesus can come back at any time. And when he comes back, eternity is sealed. So guess what that means? We need as many people in God's kingdom as quickly as possible. Why? Because eternity is at stake. Shouldn't that motivate us? This is why it's mission critical. More people in God's kingdom as quickly as possible. Our mission statement is that we exist to ignite a craving for Jesus by relentlessly loving our community. We're not going to nitpick our community. It says the community. So if you're out there, if you're living out there, if you have air in your lungs, we have a message for you. God loves you and so do we. Jesus Christ died for you. You are far from God and you all need Jesus as I needed Jesus. So if you have lungs, if you have breath in your lungs and you are out in our community, we love you and we will pray daily for something to spark, for something to be ignited up inside of you, the power of the Holy Spirit so that you turn to Jesus just like I turn to Jesus. Last week, we had this spontaneous baptism at the end of our three services. Over the weekend, we baptized 20 people that had said yes to the reckless, relentless love of Jesus Christ. And there was somebody that I baptized. That I was like, I, don't, I know I've seen her around, but I don't really know her. But, but when, when I dunked her and then brought her up out of the water, I was like, man, a whole party just erupted for you. Who is this girl? And uh, her name happened to be Kelly. And so I was like, huh. And so, uh, and so the next day, I was like, Jordan, you were part of the people like, ah, oh, like, Kelly, okay. Like, you can. And I saw Ricky, and he was going, ah, oh, Kelly, okay. I was like, who's oh, Kelly? And so I was like, Jordan, like, what's going on? And, and Jordan was like, she's, she's Ricky's girlfriend. I was like, oh, cool. And, his, he, and then he told me the story. He said, Ricky started coming to our church. Ricky said yes to relationship with Jesus Christ. Ricky got into starting point. He was like, this is, oh my gosh, like everybody needs this. Ricky turns to Jordan and says, Jordan, Kelly needs Jesus. We have to start praying for her. Ricky was praying for one before you knew what pray for one was. And then he started praying. God met him in that prayer. 
Kelly said yes to Jesus, she, said, she, she publicized that last week through baptism, and there was a celebration that occurred. Why? Because somebody was praying, and God answered that prayer and said yes to this person with a relationship with him, and we celebrate that. It's worthwhile. Do we not celebrate? Because sometimes we get frustrated with who might come to know Jesus Christ. Do we, do we not celebrate? Do we not even start the journey because we say, this person is so far gone. They, they're not worth it. They're, they will never turn to Jesus. They will never materialize. Do you say that with your 401k? Do you not say, hey, I'm going to invest $100 into my 401k and another $100 and another $100. And I'm just going to, like, you know what? Over time, I'm going to keep grinding at my 401k. Why? Because eventually it might be a million dollars. Eventually I might be able to retire. It's not going to necessarily all the time yield dividends right then and there. But we invest in it. Why? Because the end result is worth it. What can happen is worth it. And so we invest into people. Why? Because what God can do in a person's life is worth it. We get to be on the front line of God's great search and rescue party. God could send somebody else, but we will forfeit the joy that is ours by seeing people turn to Jesus. You might have a thousand excuses not to wake up and pray. You might have a thousand excuses not to, not to, not to help somebody find Jesus, and they all might be reasonable. They all might be okay, but guess what that will never lead to? An exciting life. <laughs> normal. That's normal to make excuses and to punk out. I don't want to live a normal life. <laughs> I want to live an exciting life where I'm on the front lines with Jesus Christ in the searching after people. And so my challenge for you is to pray for one. Why? Because somebody at some point was praying for you. (laughs) This is the challenge for our whole series. For the next three weeks, we're going to talk about this. Pray, go, and show. And this week, we're going to focus in on pro. So uh, pray. My challenge then specifically for this week is that we would pray for one at 732. Now, if you're like most Americans now, you have a cell phone, and it's not only a cell phone. It does other things. And for you, it might be, it might be a, an alarm clock. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do right now. Set an alarm in your phone that at 732 a.m. or p.m. or both, that you will say, I'm going to what? Label it. Pray for one. I'm going to do this every single day. For me, I put in my phone the Sound Better Together by, by Jack Johnson. I love that song. And I just thought that was appropriate. We're better together. And so that's, that's what I'm going to wake up to. Or not wake up to, but that's what I'm going to be reminded to at 732. To pray for people by name. Who's your one? I don't know. <laughs> but pray about it. And relentlessly pray for them. And then relentlessly get involved with God. To communicate to them the love of Jesus Christ. We might feel that we are too far from God. You were once too. We might feel that they are too far from God. Isn't that the point of the gospel? That we are too far from God? It, we, we might be somebody that, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is overweight and we're looking at it. I need to lose weight, but I have too far to go. And so we never even get started. We might be a business owner that says, hey, I have a great business thought, but I'm not going to do anything with it because it will never, it's, oh, it's too long until it would make me, uh, make me a profit. I don't want to grind it out because, oh, I'm just too far from that point. I might be musically inclined and say, I want to pick up a new instrument, but it will take way too long. It's too far to go to pick up a new instrument and really master the new instrument. We are, all of us at times, too far to go. We have too far to go. So where somebody that might be overweight needs a physical trainer, somebody that might need a business coach, somebody that might need a musical instructor. You know what we need when we are too far from God? We need Jesus. We point people to Jesus. He is the gospel. He is who we focus on. And what it says in Ephesians is this, Ephesians, where Paul was so far from God. Paul talks about this. I, 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 dirty rotten sinner. I, I was awful. I was doing things. And he talks about how, how far we are from God. He talks about that for a few verses. And then he says this, but God. We are all too far from God. We all were there. But he says, but God being what? Rich in what? Mercy. Not giving us what we do deserve. We do deserve a separation from the Father. But God says, I'm rich in mercy. And so I send to you Jesus. I give to you Jesus. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with whom? Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him, Jesus, in the heavenly places of Christ Jesus. We get to be in eternity celebrating with Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace in the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We have a mission to show others the powerful name of Jesus through our kindness. 
For by grace you have been what? Saved through faith. And it is not of our own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one can boast. You and I are far from God. Praise God he sent Jesus. It's nothing that you and I can do to start building up ground. We need Jesus. We tried capturing this thinking when, when you go to the bathroom here at Wellspring, there's a little sign. It's a little weird, but while you're there and you have time to read, uh, you can read this, uh, this wording. It says, Wellspring Church welcomes those who are single and married, divorced, engaged, gay or straight. We welcome the filthy rich, the dirt poor. We welcome you if English is your second language. We also welcome those who are old as dirt, skinny as a rail, or could afford to lose a few pounds. We welcome you if you are dressed to the nines or uh, the only shirt is on your back. We welcome anyone who can sing like Stevie Wonder or who, like our pastor Offensive, can't carry a tune in a bucket. We welcome you here if you are just browsing or just woke up or just got out of jail. We don't care if you are holier than Swiss cheese or haven't been to church since your nephew's baptism in 1988. We welcome the soccer moms, the NASCAR dads, the starving artists, tree huggers, latte sippers, nose pickers, tax collectors, veterans, vegetarians, and junk food junkies. If you blew all of your offering money in the casino, you are welcomed here. If you are inked, if you are pierced, or both, you are in the right place. If you are in recovery or still addicted, we are happy to see you. Why? We welcome you because we have experienced the thrill of being too far from God, of being an enemy of God. We have experienced the thrill of being welcomed by God. We were once a mess, but God willingly became, willingly welcomed us through the cross-stretched arms of Jesus. And he gave us life so that we could experience real life, receive future joy, hope, and be part of his forever family. God is delighted to see you here. And we are too. Because we were once so far from God, but God sent his son. May we get on mission with him. And may we celebrate that God allows us to be part of that mission and we see people come to know him. I want healing in our land just like the next person. And we're going to sing that song, uh, Heal Our Land. Because I think the only thing that can truly heal our land is what I experienced healing personally. I was far from God. I was a hot mess. <laughs> but then there was Jesus. And Jesus brings healing. And I think he can do that in our community when we get on mission with him. Let's worship together. Thank you for checking out a sermon recorded right here at Wellspring Church in Toms River. If it's your first time connecting with us, we'd love to stay connected with you. So don't forget to like and subscribe to this video. And then down in the description box below, there's ways to give online. There's our social media accounts. We'd love to stay connected with you throughout the week. We love and appreciate you, and we hope you have a fantastic week.